Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Greg Jericho. I'm the Chief Economist at the Australia Institute. Ebony Bennett, who normally hosts these, is unfortunately unwell today. So I have jumped into the breach to host this edition of Unparliamentary, our new fortnightly show that gives you the scoop on what's happening in federal politics with a special guest journalist. I'd, of course, like to start uh, today by acknowledging that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country, and I pay my respects to Elders past and present. For registering to, I encourage all of you to register for webinars at the Australia Institute.org.au slash forward slash, I think that is forward slash webinars. Um, just a few tips for, for those of you on the Zoom. Um, you can type in questions for our for our panelists uh, using the Q&A box and you can get to upvote other questions too. But please, of course, keep things civil and on topic or you will be booted out. Mm -hmm. Finally, this is also a live event and is being recorded. And the video of this will be available on our website, which is australiainstitute.org.au later in the day or week. So let us get to today. This week we are joined by Paul Bongiorno, a man who I've known for some time now. Um, back when I was working in The Guardian, I used to often see him coming into The Guardian office. He is the columnist for the Saturday paper and the New Daily and is, of course, a 30-year veteran of the Canberra Press Gallery. Many people will know him from his time at Channel 10. Welcome, Paul. Thanks very much, Crick. Now, for everyone, since our last episode, there has been a fairly big a big uh, amount of news going on. Australia's terror threat level was increased from possible to probable, with the war on Gaza described as a significant driver of that decision. Um, sparked by the retirements of Linda Burney and Brendan O'Connor, uh, the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese reshuffled his cabinet and has overhauled home affairs and immigration portfolios mainly. Um, after attending the first Gama Festival since last year's voice referendum, the PM appeared to back away a bit from establishing a Truth and Justice Commission, one of the pillars of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And we've also had gambling reform in the spotlight with members of the crossbench urging the government to implement a blanket ban on gambling advertising, throw in everything else about the economy, inflation, interest rates, and it has been a big week. So let's get right into it. The first one, all. The reshuffle. The PM's decision to move Claire O'Neill and Andrew Giles out of home affairs. Was this one of the most significant was the most significant, I think, decision in the cabinet shuffle. Why do you think he did this? Well, I think he did it for several reasons, but I'd have to say the first reason was a bit of political management, frankly. I think that uh, Albanese and uh, Tony Burke, who, of course, is a key strategist, parliamentary tactician par excellence, leader of the House, uh, they saw the way in which the opposition quite successfully weaponized the High Court decision with MQ... Uh, I always get this mixed up in Q Y Z. Yeah, and um, one of the, one of the problems there was there were two ministers on the floor of the house there to answer questions, and Andrew Giles, who is an intelligent, compassionate man, he's one of these sort of guys that always looks like he's startled, uh, <laughs> and and also his default position isn't to go for the juggler. The other interesting negative for him, which I'm sure many of uh, our audience would think is an, a negative. Giles actually has a reputation as being a human rights lawyer who worked quite hard for the Tampa refugees. Mm. These were the refugees that John Howard weaponized ahead of the 2001 election. And Peter Dutton and others would throw that in. It. Oh, his heart's not in it. He doesn't really want to keep the place safe. However, I think that was quite secondary to the other realization that Labor really wasn't happy with this giant home affairs department anyway. They started to repatriate uh, sections of it back to the Attorney General, for example, the AFP. Uh, and in the reshuffle, uh, ASIO went mm. back to, to, to the Attorney General. Uh, th there are a few more little nips and tucks probably needed there. But I think the main um, th the main takeout then became then became that there was only going to be one minister on the floor of the House uh, answerable to the Home Affairs 
and more importantly, I think uh, immigration uh, as well. And and uh, anyone who's ever watched Tony Burke on the floor of the House, he's probably the best performer, certainly in the government. He thinks on his feet, he's articulate, uh, and um, and well, he's politically savvy. Yeah, and certainly in the industrial affairs portfolio that that he had carriage over, he certainly is. Probably delivered some of the biggest policy wins for the government, um, certainly in terms of uh, bringing in a broader range of enterprise bargaining that, you know, for uh, I think a, a lesser performer could have been a trap of, oh, we're going back to the 70s and everything, whereas he was able to pretty deftly um, kill any of that sort of uh, concerns and and I think uh, and also delivering the employment white paper. So certainly seen as a I guess a a winner, a good performer. So is that, you know, is 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 it though a a bit of a poison chalice in being handed home affairs or is and an immigration or is it uh, just a case of uh, they needed they needed a winner in that portfolio? Well, it's a big job and uh, and it has pitfalls and uh, one of, one of the uh, issues surrounding it, which I think fed into the decision, is that the. The political default position of the of the conservatives is, I think it's undeserved, but it's still there that they're the ones that are serious about uh, you know border security and keeping Australians safe. So a Labor government has to really be on its metal and on its game to at, at least neutralise that, if not show it up for being mm, you know at least debatable. Yeah, I mean, well, also Claire O'Neill. I mean, she's very quickly trying to say this is not a, a demotion, you know, going from home affairs, a fairly major portfolio, to now being in charge of, in a sense, homelessness and housing. What's your view of that? Is it, is it a bit of a demotion or is it a case of the government realises actually housing and homelessness is actually a pretty big issue and will be a big issue coming up to the the election, so we need someone to really get onto that? Well, it's certainly not a demotion from this, from two points of view, really. She's still in Cabinet, and as you've just pointed out, uh, home uh, uh, housing and homelessness is a key battlefront, really, in the lead-up to the election. Uh, it's being uh, pursued very successfully by the Greens, Max chandler Mather, uh, and even though the opposition is coming at it from another angle, from a... From a <laughs> uh, no, not a supply side, but a demand side, and we can maybe can talk about that a bit later. Yeah. Uh, it, it it is a burning issue, and it does need someone in there. Another point I think uh, about Claire O'Neill, you see, she wasn't the shadow minister in opposition. Um, the the shadow minister in opposition was um, lost her seat at the uh, at the oh yes. election. Um, got out of my mind. It's got out of my mind as well. She uh, was in Brisbane. Yeah, no, no, she uh, wasn't. She was uh, the um. Uh, she was an American immigrant, <laughs> and she was in the Senate. And she was oh, Keneally. Keneally. Oh. Christina Keneally. Got it. See, I could see her, but I couldn't think of it. Christina Keneally was, and she she was right on top of that brief. Mm. So O'Neill came in, if you like, cold as the new minister, whereas Tony Burke had been twice before mm. the, the immigration minister. So he brought with him the sort of experience that O'Neill hadn't. But having said that, talking to people who worked with her, and uh, I noticed that Abel Rizvi, the former Deputy Secretary of Immigration Department, is highly praiseworthy of the job O'Neill was doing there, cleaning up what Rizvi and others, I mean, we had three independent inquiries pointing out that basically home affairs and immigration was a mess, uh, thanks to the way in which Dutton primarily uh, had been dealing with it. Yeah, and I mean, that's... A thing that I think people might have forgotten is that uh, Home Affairs is a new portfolio, really. It was only brought in under Malcolm Turnbull as uh, what most saw was almost a bit of a gift to Peter Dutton to keep him quiet, which yeah. didn't quite work as planned. Yeah. But it gives someone more power so they, they'll they be less of a powerful figure. Seems an odd way to go about things. But <laughs> there was a lot of controversy and pushback on actually creating such a massive portfolio to cover all this disparate sort of events. And you're right, it does seem like Labor, they're not getting rid of the name, but they're kind they're of shaking away. away. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you point to Tony Burke, who's been, uh, who was a former Minister for Immigration. Mm. How do you think the opposition are going to tackle immigration as a, as we know they always will in the run-up to the election, how are they going to use Tony Burke as 
the the new guy who they have to combat are they going to keep the same tack or are they going to take a different one to that they had under jo- well, I, I, against Giles? Well, I look for every opportunity to attack the government and, and therefore uh, Burke. Um, they'll have to be a bit more careful and they know if they, you know, if they, <laughs> if they um, punch him, well, I'm going to a biblical reference, if they t- punch him on one side of the face, they're just likely to get hit back on both, you know. They yeah. won't be turning the cheek by any means. Uh, uh, but as, as I say, it, it's a def- they would see it as a default position for them, a, a strength for them that what they'll uh, try to pursue. Um, um, but they'll just probably have to be, uh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. well, fairly astute in the way in which they do it. Uh, having having said that, uh, it, it's interesting that um, there's a bit of dovetailing with uh, immigration and housing because the the, the popular uh, perception is and 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 the the, the in a sense, the lazy go-to attack is you, bra- you blame immigration for the housing shortage. And already yeah. Michael Sukar, the shadow minister, has been doing that, saying, oh, well, Claire O'Neill's now going to housing to try and clean up the mess that she started with the immigration. Whereas uh, people in both home affairs and immigration will tell you that the housing shortage didn't begin this year or all last year. You could probably go back 20 years or more when federal governments and state governments yeah. stopped building houses. And the other point, and, and uh, talking to Claire O'Neill's people, one of the things that she she's highly aware of and from discussions with the economic team of the government is that she has to push very strongly that the real issue here is the supply side issue, that the government has actually put $32 billion out there, that, that it is negotiating with the states and territories, and that even some of the other quick answers, for example, that the Greens are coming up with, for example, uh, on capital gains tax and negative gearing, even if they did it, that wouldn't solve the supply side immediately. You know, I mean, mm. it's not as if there's a magic wand here. And therefore, O'Neill will, will uh, there'll be a lot of pressure on her to show that, hang on, unlike what, what the charges that the Greens are making of us or if the opposition is making of us, and, and perhaps first home buyers and others who can't get a rental or, or, or buy a house, we are, in fact, doing something, mm. you know. Now it's a hard ask, but uh, but that uh, that's her task. Yeah, and your your point on it being a, a long term problem is is certainly well made. I mean, it's something that we here have been uh, looking at, and I've written on a number of times. Yep. Back in the back in the fifties and sixties, and even into the seventies, um, you know, public housing was around anywhere between ten and fifteen percent of new builds were public housing. Yep. Now it's less than two. And it's been less than two since pretty much the GFC, you know, since uh, around 2013 uh, when someone got elected. And um, you're right, it's it's hard to turn that ship around. But coming up to the election, being told, oh, it's hard to turn that ship around is not a winning strategy. So you need someone who at least can, can prosecute that. And I think all of this talk about immigration, about... Um, uh, you know, housing and all this leads into our next topic of social cohesion, mm. which you know very much. I think it it they they collide, unfortunately. And we saw this week ASIO raising the threat level uh, from uh, possible to to probable, which um, they were quick to uh, state. It does not mean it definitely will happen, but as soon as you start talking the probable, things are probably going to happen. That uh, does get concerning. Well, I'm not a mathematician, but yeah. I noticed that Burgess, the uh, um, uh, the, gen- uh, what they, what they call the uh, head of ASIO, uh, he said it means that there's a more than 50% yeah. chance that, some, that something is going to happen. I was talking to a few people in the government, and they're a bit suspicious that maybe ASIO thinks that something more than, more than that, but it doesn't want to scare the horses. Well, uh, we don't know, so we're not to be alert. Was we? We're not to be alert and alarmed anymore, as John Howard. Be alert, you know? not alarmed. Yeah, 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 yeah. The reason. yeah. We're, we're supposed to be aware, but not afraid. Yeah, well, hopefully <laughs> they're not all going to be sending out the fridge magnets again. Yeah, well, I think so. <laughs> I'd probably find my old fridge magnet. Yeah. I mean, the the statement from ASIO and from the Prime Minister was that this was all part of a, a rise in polarisation that we're seeing in Australia and Western nations, and very much coming out of the, uh, I think we can just say the war on Gaza mm. and um, that being a significant driver. And I think crucially, it was, I think, made clear that it's not just one side. It, it's it's both sides here where 
um, they weren't suggesting that oh, it's it's just uh, Islamophobic um, concerns or Zionist concerns. It was just the in f the overall um, polarization that's occurring. And how do you think the the government is doing in 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 its attempts to calm tensions? And what do you think it can do to try and calm these tensions? Okay. Well, look, the the threat levels on. Uh, is multi-dimensional. Yeah. So uh, the Gaza situation is definitely, uh, you know, a factor, maybe a major factor, but there are others because did you notice that the um, the Director General also was talking about young males and gaming? Yeah. See, older people like myself and maybe even you, Greg, aren't aware that these kids, teenagers and perhaps in, into the early, they're on these games and they're very brutal games. You know, like it's how many people you've killed and how many times and, and it's all there and it's all a game. And the, the trouble is when when uh, fantasy crosses over into reality. So that's a big dimension. But coming back to the, the issue of social cohesion when it comes to Islamophobia and, and anti-Semitism, well, the fact of the matter, just on, on, on the balance of things, the... Palestinian, Arab, and Muslim community in Australia is ten times bigger than the Jewish community, so and and uh, so so you've got around about a million people that fit into that um, category. Uh, uh, but on both sides, you've got people um, with relatives and friends in the Middle East, in Israel, or in the Palestinian territories, uh, that are very invested just at that level. But there's another issue, too, that I'm sure people have noticed, that the opposition has taken a one-sided view of the conflict. It, they're all in with Israel. Uh, I can't remember any criticism that Peter Dutton or any of his front bench have made of the way in which the Netanyahu government is waging that war. And I think this also ups the, the political heat. Uh, it, it sort of becomes in a... Uh, part of the culture war, you know, touchstone, yep. and uh, and and I think that this is dangerous. Uh, I know the Greens are highly critical of uh, this uh, raising of the t the threat level, uh, and they accuse um, Albanese of of trying to stifle their criticism of the way in which uh, Israel is handling the war and their criticism of the Albanese government for not being more forthright uh, yeah. and, and um, in the way in which it maybe could put pressure on is Israel. So all of that is there, and it is true in a contested democracy like our own, people should be free to criticise, but I suppose the warning here is, well, when you criticise... Don't, for example, say that the Australian government is responsible for every Israeli bomb that falls. Mm. You know, I mean, I think that this can raise tensions and this this can make people angry. One of the things I noticed that the um, uh, Burgess from ASIO was pointing out is that in, in many ways they're flying blind because, say, someone who is emotionally fraught about the issue, say, even at a, outside the prime minister's office or somewhere else, if, if, if their emotions get the better of them, they break the front window and storm in, and they might inadvertently hit one of the staffers over the head. Mm. You know what I mean? So it's even down at that level that we're actually talking about. And what we're seeing certainly in the UK at the moment is that uh, actually the, and this I think goes very well with, with our talk about immigration, where I think we can certainly say the media, but um, certainly coming off uh, the election where there was a, fairly disgraceful rhetoric and, and policies, to be honest, around migration in the UK. Yeah. And I think going to what you're talking about, the online culture, where you've got these, especially young males, very much um, egged on by these alt-right figures. Yeah. And it has broken out in some fairly um, major violence, you know, where it's... Um, there's certainly no intent of peaceful protest. They're, they're out to, to do harm. And I guess if you're the if you're ASIO, you'd be looking over at that. And, you know, we're talking about um, this. It's it's easy to think, oh, it's all due to, to Gaza. But actually, if you look over in what's happening in the UK, that's sort of a part of it. But there's a whole lot of other simmering tensions. And so, racism yeah. and immigration, yeah. without a doubt. Exactly. And, and uh, for example... 
what seemed to have triggered uh, the riots now in Britain was people like Nigel Farage and others assuming off the top that the assailant was Muslim. Mm. Now, the assailant didn't turn out to be Muslim, but he did turn out to be black. Yeah. And this, again, feeds into that racial uh, attitude uh, that is being fostered by the alt-right, the skinheads and all, all of the rest of them. And, uh, and, and this is the real danger that, uh, that is there, but it's certainly here as well. Mm, absolutely. You know? So, yeah, it's certainly something that it's always a case with the... It was, I guess, easier um, under the Howard years when you were talking about threat levels, it was pretty much just in relation to the war on terror and things like this, whereas now it's a, a little bit more multifaceted and uh, just assuming, oh, this has got something to do with um, tensions in the Middle East, mm. it's, well, might actually have tensions in with far-right groups here in Australia. Yeah. Um, well, migration has always, of, always been yeah. fraught. I, I remember going back, um, it, it fed into... One Nation and Hanson, but there used to be uh, Australians against further immigration. Mm. Uh, they were fairly well below the radar in those days, but they used to pull 7% of the vote yeah. in, in general elections. So it's always there. One of the great things about, one of the great success stories of Australia as a multicultural society is that right from the get-go post-war, immigration was seen as a positive and a good, and a good you know, pop, pop, uh, what is it, populate or perish yeah. and all of that. The danger we've got now with the narratives and the culture wars surrounding Israel, Gaza, Muslims, Middle Eastern people and all of, all of that um, is that my, immigration and migration has become a negative and it even feeds into the economic debate now. Well, you know, yeah. we can talk about population and all of that, but business in Australia will, will, will point to the fact if you didn't have immigration and, and even the levels that we've seen raised in the last couple of years, well, we'd be in recession. Yeah. And on the on the topic of social cohesion and and actually sort of a multicultural society, a, the, a big uh, event this this week was the Gama Festival, mm. uh, where the Prime Minister attended and Peter Dutton uh, notably did not. Um, but that doesn't mean it was all smooth sailing for the Prime Minister. Um, and he he expressed support in principle. At, and of course, this was the first. Uh, Gama Festival since the the voice referendum, so tensions were always going to be pretty high um, because of just uh, the, I think we can rightly say the upset that uh, was caused by um, or that came out of the the failure of the referendum. The Prime Minister reiterated his support in principle for the concept of of um, Agrada. Mm. This. But he kind of seemed to to hedge it, or, or he slip sliding he away. Slips like he kind of, uh, someone said he's white splaining what it means, and he's sort of <laughs> talking about, oh, it's a coming together after a struggle where um, many indigenous leaders and people are saying, uh, actually, we're talking about truth and treaty process. That was a central element of the Uluru statement. Why do you think he's hedging here? Why do you think he's not sort of uh, fully supporting what uh, was in the Uluru Statement. Greg, I think we just have to be brutally frank about all of this. There is absolutely no doubt that post the a referendum, there is no consensus anymore in Australia on reconciliation. The failure of the referendum has set back um, racial harmony between uh, uh, the, the majority of Australians of whatever stripe and the Indigenous or First Nations people. That's been a huge cost, a huge price that this nation has paid with the, um, uh, the loss of the, of the referendum. Uh, now, having, having said that, and, and, and to give weight to that to statement, uh, you, you are now seeing Peter Dutton and his shadow minister, Jacinta Price, just by the by, Dutton has twice in uh, news conferences on Friday and on the weekend has dropped Nampajimpa. She's now Jacinta ah. Rice. Now, he may have forgotten or he can't remember how to pronounce it. But the message is, the message is, look, there'll be no Makarada, there'll be no truth-telling, there'll be, there'll be no uh, advancing treaty. We're just interested in 
being practical and we're not going to things like Gama, which is just all grandstanding. And Jacinta Price has even got the, uh, the point that she said she didn't go there. It's all about grandstanding. I'm not interested in, in words. I'm interested in action. Now, that, that can be superficially attractive, except what we have to remember in, 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 in all of this, and I can remember having a long discussion with Warren Snowden, who, who was the longtime member for Lingiari, and, I mean, he wept, you know, almost tears of blood when Labor lost the election, and a number of programs that were being advanced in Lingiari in, in, uh, uh, in the Northern Territory were cut, and while the, um, Jacinta Price was the deputy mayor of Alice Springs, the... Um, starting with the Abbott government, but followed up by other coalition governments over those nine years, funding was cut substantially. And you'd have to say, well, you, you were there for nine years, you played, a, you played an important part. It, it is, again, disturbing, particularly to me, when I saw in the Sydney Morning Herald on Saturday quotes from Price uh, that basically... There's nothing special about uh, Indigenous Australians. They should be treated like all other Australians and their problems are, 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 are issues that all Australians have to deal with and we deal with it in that way. Well, this is assimilationism writ mm. large. When Pauline Hanson made similar statements, you know, what was it, more than 10 years ago now, well, she was roundly criticised. But now we've got uh, Jacinta Price saying it and because I, I guess uh, she is an indigenous Australian, people are, you know, are reluctant to sort of nail it, frankly. Yeah, and of course the problem is, uh, it's all very nice to say that, but the, the problem is that they are not treated um, the same as others, are discriminated against and have been discriminated against for centuries. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't just uh, wipe away that uh, uh, structural racism and discrimination that they've occurred by just saying, oh, well, it's, it's all good now. We're all, all the same. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, look, precisely. Yeah. I mean, basically, the failure of the referendum was a failure, obviously, of Australians to grasp that there was such a thing as dispossession, that the heirs or the people that were dispossessed exist today, and much of their situation, as you say, is as a result of that, uh, and that that it, it would have been a unifying rather than a, a divisive issue if we accepted the truth of our settlement and yeah. came to terms with it. Whereas um, Dutton and Price now want to have nothing to do with that at all. We do have to remember that Peter Dutton didn't turn up to the apology. He said he regretted it, but he's not regretting any of it right now. Yeah. And this, I think, is, is then the politics of the situation now. Dutton was able to successfully say that Albanese was more worried about the voice in Makarada than he was worried about the cost of living. Uh, and even though it wasn't true, and even though you could show uh, what um, the Labor government had done in two successive uh, uh, budgets, uh, that uh, seemed to resonate out there. And I think Albanese has had to make a very hard-nosed judgment that he's not going to, between now and the next election, be painted into a corner where the only thing he's talking about, uh, you know, is, is uh, truth and treaty. But in the meantime, as we saw at Gama on the weekend, he has unveiled millions of dollars mm. of, of uh, um, um, work uh, to address the gap uh, to dovetail ab Aboriginal communities in with made in Australia and, and all of that sort of stuff, which, of course, the opposition is ridiculing. But I think that if you have a close, uh, dispassionate look at it, um, you know, you can argue that uh, that this, in a way, is doing exactly what Dutton and Price are demanding. Yeah, I mean, you, and it's always a problem with, with issues like this where the government can seem to try to appease or, or take the, the fight away from the opposition, but the opposition pays no attention to the fact that uh, you're doing exactly... Yeah, we've seen this with climate change. We've seen this all manner of... or Let alone migration, where yeah. essentially the policies are exactly the same, but yeah. it, it, it doesn't really matter. And your point about... And I, I, I agree with you that the Prime Minister seems... would not want this to be any sort of an issue at all um, in the run-up to the election. The problem for those, um, for Indigenous people and for anyone who is pushing for truth and treaty is, in a sense, that that rules out anything happening in the next term 
um, because we've seen this term that uh, Anthony Albanese is very big on keeping his promises and and uh, unless it was something major like stage three, he's not one for saying, oh, well, we didn't promise it, but we'll do it, you know. And so if he, if he has not actually made any commitment towards anything in the run-up to the election, it's going to be hard uh, to get him to move in the next three years. Well, I agree with that, except talking to um, some fairly senior people in the government, they realise they can't go to the next election as the incumbent government as a small target. Mm. They have to put something out there that will excite uh, 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 the Australian electoral to stick with them. And, and part of the thinking of Albanese was, I don't want to scare the horses. I don't want to come in and be seen as this radical Labor government that's going to destroy everything. I want to come in and, you know, softly, softly. Mm -hmm. A good example, you know, is what we were talking about earlier with Tony Burke. He has a he uh, actually achieved enormous reform mm -hmm. in the area of workplace relations. But you know what they did? They did it in their first year quickly when, when as we know, the Senate skews left. The Greens quibbled here and there, but they were on mm. side. The crossbench was on side, and they were able to get it through. Of course, now in the third year of our cycle, everybody, the Greens, the crossbench, the Libs, the Nats, they're all there. Look at me. And the best way to be looked at is to stand in the way yeah. of the government. Yeah, it was really only on, on workplace relations where the government did seem to have a real urgency of mm. knowing, actually, we've got to do things now yeah. because your honeymoon goes and... Um, you got to use your political capital while you got it. Yep. And they probably, I, I think we can argue that they, they did sort of let a lot of it just go to, to waste there. But which brings us, I think, what we, we can talk about migration and all, all the other factors. But we know that when it gets to the election, everyone's going to be talking the economy. And when we talk the economy, we're talking inflation, you know, cost of living. Mm. Um, the latest inflation figures and came out actually showed that uh, even though inflation went up slightly from 36 to 3.8%, core inflation came down. And we're recording this um, an hour before the Reserve Bank comes out and tells us, but I think it, it would be a shock if they were to do anything other than keep interest rate low. What was, how, do you th how did the government uh, respond to the figures and how is their thinking about uh, how they're going to tackle inflation and the fact that it, it seems unlikely there's going to be an interest rate cut very soon, but very it seems unlikely there's going to be a rate rise. How's that affected their planning and their thinking towards the next election? Well, well, first of all, um, they're hoping by the next election there will be some interest rate relief. Uh, and to help that along the way, um, they, they, des uh, they designed packages like rent relief, uh, energy bill relief, uh, um, uh, medicines, uh, cheaper medicines, uh, rental relief as well, uh, that everyone expects to feed into the next lot of inflation numbers so that uh, inflation is expected, uh, you know, to come down for other reasons as well, but helped along by these government uh, measures. Uh, and um, Greg, I'd be interested to get your view on this, but I see uh, yesterday... Um, uh, Gittins in the Sydney Morning Herald qu quoting the uh, economists from the uh, Australian, um, uh, from ACOS, from mm. the uh, Social Security area. And of course, uh, if anyone follows um, Stephen Kukoulos, he's been absolutely adamant that they should start cutting rates. And if they don't start cutting them, we'll be in a recession before we know it. And I, uh, I was reading Stephen this morning. There's some interesting indicators, especially if America starts cutting rates and especially the way in which the U.S. market was spooked yesterday, that we're, we're getting into very murky waters and, uh, uh, you know, the numbers showing that employment in Australia is softening. It could well be that the bank, uh, you know, will, will uh, as some, uh, you know, some economists, for example, the Westpac economists are saying that the next figures that come out uh, on growth will be negative. Mm. So if all this is happening, um, you, you'd imagine that we'll, we'll, the bank will have to move on rates. Yeah, I mean, certainly we we hear for a very long time, and I think we were kind of lone hands. Uh, certainly Steve Kukolis was one who was, who was kind of with us in that we were thinking you can't raise rates while the economy is going so slow 
you only had to look at retail spending going backwards, mm. household consumption going backwards, mm. and even employment was was mainly growing, growing, and and thankfully unemployment not rising. But when you unpick the figures, you saw most of it was coming from sort of that public non-market sector of NDI spending, um, education, and and broader healthcare, and a bit of construction, but. Overall, the private sector was going, no, no one's out there spending. Everyone is hurting um, because of interest rate rises. And I think you're right. America, everyone got spooked this week because uh, some bad unemployment figures. I think, um, and it's it's always one of those things, everyone wants the interest rate cuts, but often the reason the Reserve Bank cuts interest rates is because the economy is doing badly. Precisely. <laughs> and so... Um, I think it's more likely now that there will be a cut sooner than than later than it was, say, a month ago. And certainly all of our push has been, you know, we knew that inflation was driven initially by mainly by corporate profits, by supply-side factors, um, where due to the Ukraine invasion, due to coming out of COVID, and due to companies going, oh, it's a good time to raise prices, no one will care. Mm. And we haven't seen wages grow strongly at all. They haven't been pushing it. And it was interesting, I noticed last week, when it went up to three points, from 3.6 to 3.8, and if you, if that had happened a couple months ago, everyone would go, oh, see, the Reserve Bank's got to go harder. You know, the, they haven't been tough enough. And yet last week, everyone was like, yeah, no, they won't move. They, in fact, actually, next one's going to be a cut. It seems there has been a bit of a change in the mindset across a lot of economists that actually we have gone hard and um, inflation perhaps is not the big concern at the moment is and everyone everyone knows in in um in politics the cost of living is always present but another thing that is big is losing your job and when unemployment starts rising that's when uh things start turning bad for for government. So I think they'll certainly be worried about that. The the opposition have been trying to to blame this all on the government, saying it's all homegrown inflation and uh, that it's, um, you know, due to their massive spending commitments. How, how do you think that's landing? Is is that taking some skin off the government or do you think people are thinking, look, we, we know what's driving it. It's, there's a lot of other factors here. Okay, well... Um... It's interesting that um, the um, Newgate poll on the mood of the nation uh, last week, which I quoted in my Senate paper column, uh, shows that Australians uh, do accept that government taxes, and by government they mean federal, state and local, uh, contribute you know, to the, to, to the pain when they get their rates and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. But they do accept all those other factors. And I'm told that research that the Labor Party has been doing is that people do accept that a lot of the problem is out of the hands of the government or the opposition. Yeah. So then, and this is where we're getting to, I think, on a whole range of things, housing including, that 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 the acid will also, when, when push comes to shove, when we get to vote on who do we want going forward, people won't say, well, not all that impressed with Albanese and, and, and Chalmers maybe, well, what are the other side offering? Now, as of today, what they are offering is scorched earth. Mm. I mean, if you take them at their word, if the spending is too great, and, and as Chalmers points out, what is it, the $12 billion that's there to, to help out with a bit of relief out of a $2 trillion economy, if that's too much, oh, and if, if the 30,000 public servants you think are too many and you'll sack them all, then that comes... So, so, so you say, well, let's put all this together. So you're going to go in for austerity and severe cuts and, and, and you're going to go in for severely cutting services. I mean, why have we got more public mm -hmm. servants? Because services were so dire that this had to be addressed. Now, will will voters accept that, that the alternative answer is actually the medicine in the alternative is actually worse than what they're putting up with now yeah. with the current government? And I think that this is probably politically where we're going. So, I mean, certainly Labor would be pointing over to the UK and uh, seeing what happened with all the austerity over there and where they are now. And and I think you can certainly lay claim to the lack of social cohesion and the, yeah. the riots happening over there because services have been destroyed. And, Absolutely. And inequality becomes rampant and, and things fall apart. And 
I th um, we'll just get to questions a bit. There's one more topic I'd like to sort of um, touch on because it has, uh, I think it does have a bit of uh, a, a chance of becoming a bit of a political hot potato, not so much because of voters, but because of the makeup of parliament and the crossbenches, and that's a gambling reform where last year a bipartisan committee that was chaired by the, the late Labor MP Peter Murphy, a wonderful MP, mm. uh, and just person really, um, recommended a blanket ban on gambling advertising. And Certainly here at the Australia Institute, we have done a fair bit of polling and, and work on gambling advertising. And our polling has found, for example, in South Australia that, you know, about 75% of voters were in favour of just a blanket ban on gambling advertising, that there really is no support. No one likes watching footy and up comes that gambling ad again and again. And it seems to be all there is, and especially watching it with your kids and things like that. So... Whereas the government has come out and said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to put in some conditions, maybe we'll look restrictions. at restrictions, we'll look at digital things. And the reaction from the crossbenchers, especially David Pocock, mm -hmm. Senator here in the ACT, has not been good. How do you think this is going to go over there, especially when they come back and try to actually push this legislation through? Well, first of all, there is absolutely no doubt, and the evidence given to the Murphy Committee and, and listening to experts on the harm of gambling, there is no doubt that uh, that gambling is as harmful to the body politic uh, in Australia as tobacco was. So there's no... And, and if we could uh, do everything uh, in our power to deter people, especially young kids, teenagers uh, and younger adults, from thinking that gambling was integral to sport, we would actually save... Um, uh, billions of dollars in, in, in the way uh, we have to deal with the uh, breakdown in families, health, and all that sort of thing. So, so at face value, it's a complete no-brainer. Now, I'm going to become a, I'm going to become a political commentator now, right? And I'd like you I'd like to remind our audience of the Tasmanian Labor Party in the 2018 state election which found in set, both in its own polling and in the published polling that Tasmanians hated pokies in pubs. They thought that uh, people were spending all their wages in the pubs all around the state, and why don't you save us, save families and get rid of the pokies in the pubs? So uh, Rebecca White was the Labor leader. She thought she was on a terrific winner. But when polling day came, and after the, um, according to White, the Liberals were able to spend $5 million worth of uh, donations coming from the pub lobby, lobby and the gambling lobby, uh, Labor lost. Yeah. So, and part of the big argument there was, oh, so you want Labor to pull the pokies out of all the pubs? Do you know that those pokies employ 1,000 or 2,000 people? We're talking about yeah. Tasmania. It's only the yeah. size of the ACT. So that went bang like yeah. that. Now... Let me come back to, to this. You'd say, well, okay, we're not talking about pokies and pubs here. We're just talking about taking ads off TV. Right. This is what the Labor government has arraigned against it on this issue. Well, uh, it's got the AFL and the NRL. Already, these two major sporting codes uh, have been banging on the door of the minister saying this is funding, uh, you know, community sport. This yeah. is... This is funding the terrific uh, way in which we present the sport, and Australians love their sport. You know, so so you can imagine if they if, if the plug is pulled, they might in the run up to an election say, you know, Anthony Albanese is destroying the AFL. You know, that's one thing. Yeah. The next thing you've got uh, arranged against them is Australia's major media outlets, particularly commercial television, uh, who literally do have their backs to the wall yeah. and who. Uh, it's a fully dependent on, on this revenue. Uh, then, then of course, you've got other interests in the media as well because the commercial media is hurting badly. Uh, an example, on the, the new dailies had to pull back the number of columns they want me to write for, and they've had to have retrenchments because even though I said to them, oh, but you've got advertisements all over your site. Mm. He said, I know, but no one's paying enough for them. Yeah. And that's what all the media, mainstream media is finding 
as well. So that's what's arrayed against them. Now, I heard Jeff Kinnett on Radio National this morning, the former Premier of Victoria, he said they should bite the bullet. We heard all these arguments about tobacco mm. and sport. We should do it. And he said we had to do it at Hawthorne because he was the president yep. of the Hawthorne Football Club. You have to just reposition the way in which you're going to fund going ahead. I do think there's a lot of uh, strength in that argument, but I, I can see the sorts of pressures that a government that is two seats away from minority uh that um that that has have been politically timid on so many fronts would probably uh hate the thought of having news corp even angry with it yeah. and, and and the mainstream you know channel seven nine and ten running you know pretty strong campaigns you might have seen they've already been yeah. running a pretty rabid campaign over the fact that they're demanding that on the new smart TVs that that they're yeah. uh, um, sites be by law be mm. put front and central, all that sort of stuff. So look, that's the broader politics of it. And the last thing to say that even though the um, the the opposition brought in the, the Liberals, uh, David Coleman brought in a private members' bill last June restricting gambling, not banning it, but restricting gambling on television. Uh, so close to what the leaks seem to be suggesting the government's up to. If Albanese bit the bullet, do you honestly think that Peter Dutton wouldn't join yeah. the AFL and everybody else saying, you know, uh, at, at attacking the decision as, as what choice are you giving people? It's a free country. Why can't we gamble? And why can't legal entities like gambling, even multinational gambling companies, why can't they uh, in a free country uh, advertise? I mean, that that you've got to think as a word, you know, two steps ahead of the politics of all of this. Yeah, it's, it is not uh, a, uh, it's, it's one of those issues where we, I think everyone knows that gambling is insidious and the, the way the gambling is being marketed is very much insidious, certainly towards younger people. Um, but yeah, the, the real politic is, is pretty tough. So it'll be interesting to see how they go about, especially if David Pocock keeps um, pushing and perhaps uh, starts demanding things, but I guess the government knows it could push through a restriction legislation. The Libs would probably get on board because it's um, they could basically copy what they did. Let's just get to a few quick questions. There's a, a really nice sneaky one from um, for you from John Beswick who says, is Tony Burke being given opportunity to prove himself as the alternative to Richard Miles for when Albo finally steps down? <laughs> because I guess, you know, taking over home affairs does kind of put you often in conflict with the Attorney General. You're, you, There is a fair bit of crossover. Mm. Uh, look, well, look, without a doubt, I, I, I think it, uh, it goes a long way to... Um, you know, to to let, uh, as we were discussing earlier, let Tony Burke put his name up in in lights, uh, aided and abetted, as we've seen by Albanese, who I think actually is desperate for, for Burke to do well anyway. I, I do notice, I think Phil Curry, uh, was it Phil? I was, um, a comment, a bit of analysis in the AFR this weekend was suggesting that Elbow's doing a John Howard when Howard was trying to play Peter Reith off against uh, Peter Costa. Yeah. Uh, so is Elbow trying to play, um, you know, Miles off off against Burke? W what should be remembered is that both Miles and Burke actually bought the numbers from the right to Albanese. Yes. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure that analysis works too much. And I even think that even if Burke didn't get home affairs, uh, you'd have to say he's pretty high in the running as a successor, depending depending on when and if Albanese goes. Just a point about Albanese. Uh, and comparisons with other prime ministers. Do you know it took John Howard three elections to actually be perceived as a mm. successful prime minister? They sort of have, they, they they can become part of the furniture, and if they get by, I mean, we forget uh, Howard's near death in three mm. elections yeah. in a row. You know, so Albanese, I, I don't think we should write him off in the sense that he he may well be around for another three terms. You know, so that should factor into our thinking as well. Um, Jay Wilson asked, and this one's a bit of a foreign affairs one. How um, 
what do you think of the or how close do you think we are to a regional war in the Middle East? Given that uh, Bibi Netanyahu does seem intent on trying to draw in Iran and then USA as well into it, and what do you think would be the implications for Australia if the missiles really do start flying? Because we know certainly with AUKUS, Australia is pretty closely attached to the hip with whatever America does. How do you think a, a government would? Uh, would we just keep right out of it and say, yeah, that's that's not one for us. We'll keep doing what we're doing, but you guys play amongst yourselves. We're not going to be sending your troops like we did for Iraq and, Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 there's as many experts on foreign affairs as there are, there are as many views. And it could well depend on the shape of this war. If, you know, I'm inclined to think, based on some of the analysis I've read, that it won't it won't mirror what we're seeing in Gaza. We're basically basically it's World War Two, you know, with tanks mm. and bombs. You know, uh, okay, so we've got missiles and other things, but I I can't see. I I would imagine that uh, that uh, Iran will keep using its proxy. So I can't. I can't see Iran, as it were, mobilizing its air force and its uh, military. You know. You know, to to, to attack Israel, uh, certainly um, the United States. I think have they got two carriers and all that. Uh, they're they're upping the yeah. number of uh, troops they're putting in the area. Um, it, it, it certainly hope not, but uh, uh, but of course there's plenty of precedent for Israel taking on Hezbollah in Lebanon, and 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 that of course we're talking about heightening tensions. Well, I can remember years ago when I was in um, Europe, uh, um, when Reagan um, uh, misstepped over Lebanon and yes. every American embassy around the world was under siege. I can remember the, the they had to put tanks outside the US embassy in Rome. Yeah, yeah. And one final one, I'm sorry, this is all we got time for, from Ronald Smith. He, he goes towards public housing and it's an interesting one about uh, why can't we get public housing back above the state, you know, pushing that back? And I was thinking about what we're seeing happening in Queensland with the, the Queensland Premier getting kind of a bit bolshy about actually the government buying empty properties, really pushing the fact that today announced that uh, they'll be, they're, they're looking at having public ownership of petrol stations out in regions. Do you think there's any appetite amongst the 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 Albanese government for actually getting a bit more involved in these public services and public things that in the past were done in the public sector, but were all now privatised and, and things. Is there a sense that actually government should be solving these? Absolutely. I think we're seeing, um, we're seeing a huge mood shift after, what is it, almost 25 years of neoliberal mm. uh, trickle-down economics. Privatisation has palpably failed. In Britain, for example, if you want to go from Bristol to London on the train, you almost have to you know, hock something to afford the train fare because it's all been privatised. You know? Yeah. Oh, it's a shock when you visit, visit and say, oh, God, I can remember this was, you know, cheaper. But even in Australia now, I mean, look, look, we've got the Conservative parties uh, basically wanting to nationalise uh, uh, e energy creation through nuclear. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, so, so, pe so, so people, I think, have seen that the experiment with privatisation hasn't worked. Ironically, in Queensland, Queensland was the only state that didn't privatise mm. any of its yep. electric generation. And as a result, they've been able to advance much more quickly in the transition to renewables with um, some of the uh, Stanwell, I think it is. I mean, it's, it's got a huge wind farm and solar farm next door to yep. it, you know, all yep. this sort of stuff, precisely because the state government owns it. Yep. Uh, and whereas el elsewhere in the country, we flogged them all off, you know, you know, now to our detriment. Yep, absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree with those sentiments. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Three questions. I see that there was a massive amount of chat going on. Really glad that you're all able to chat with each other as well as uh, make comments. Thank you very much, Paul, for coming along and chatting with us. It's been absolutely great to to meet up with you again and this time to actually chat online don't forget everyone subscribe to australia institute on youtube to catch all of our webinars subscribe uh, go to our website australia institute forward slash webinars to subscribe to the webinar so you'll get alerts that these are on and you can make sure you get involved 
Um, you can also subscribe to our podcast, Follow the Money, Mine, uh, Dollars and Cents, which comes out uh, generally Thursday afternoons or Friday mornings, and After America with our wonderful uh, foreign affairs researcher, Emma Shortis, who really will probably be getting into the Veep stakes. And, and if Kamala Harris has picked her VP uh, candidate while we're talking, all on that. Thank you all for turning in and we'll see you all or hopefully Ebony will be back from feeling ill next week. See you all. Bye and thanks. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy our videos, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button to get notified when we publish a new one. See you next time.